So, welcome to our very first live broadcast over the internet via WebEx um, of the Denver Area Access User Group. Group, excuse me. Um, tonight, my name is Sue Matheson, and we'll be talking tonight about functions in Access, how they are used, and how to create your own, and how to use the, the ones built in Access. So, first of all, what is a function? What defines how a function works in Visual Basic and in Access? Um, we will talk about the built-in functions, the intrinsic functions, and also um, custom functions. You can make up your own. Um, we'll go through all the different ways to use them inside of Access. Um, it's not just limited to code. You can use them in queries, in forms, reports, all kinds of places. Uh, we will talk about the expression builder. If you are new to Access, this may be something that's a little confusing that uh, you know, it comes up you click on that, oh, maybe there's some choices, and the screen pops up, and you're not really sure what that is. So we'll go over how to use the Expression Builder. And then we will spend some time going through a bunch of the built-in um, functions, and we'll look at how they work. All right. So what is a function? In general, um, I, I actually went and looked this up, and I found, um, <laughs> I found lots of descriptions of a function as just a chunk of code that does some work. Um, inputs and outputs are kind of optional depending on what language you're using, what kind of programming you're doing. Um, but in Visual Basic, um, and also in most programming languages, there's a very specific definition of what a function is. Um, inputs are optional, but the function is a chunk of code that does something and then returns a value. So, um, so chunks of code can do lots of things, but the key thing here is that there's some answer that gets passed back. All right, um, and with Visual Basic, we can choose to pass information into the function. That's optional. Um, but the passing the information back, there is something that always comes back. All right, so in Access, um, like I mentioned, we can use them in all the different objects. Um, some places are more useful than others, but we'll go through those and talk about those. This little screenshot here is the expression builder that I mentioned. Once you have um, created functions, or if you know, familiar, you know, you're familiar with some existing functions that you would like to use, you can use this expression builder to help you make sure you get all the right arguments in there. We'll talk about arguments too. All right, and then you can make your own custom functions. And this will be in Visual Basic. Um, so we'll talk about the, the basic structure of a function, what's required, um, how VBA interprets what you type here. And then this is a list of a whole bunch of built-in functions that we will go through um, as time permits. All right. Uh, finally, I have a couple of places. Um, Anymore, nobody can know everything that there is to know, so Google is our friend. And when I went to look for functions, I just did a Google search, and these are a couple of resources that I found. Um, this first one, techonthenet.com slash access slash functions, that one's pretty easy to, to duplicate. Um, that gives a really nice list of a bunch of built-in functions with some examples. This second link here is the one that Microsoft puts out. Um, I will also put this presentation up on the Meetup site so that you don't have to, to write down these links. You can just download the presentation and click on them from there. And we'll do a little um, ASCII character conversion along the way. So there's an ASCII table.com. Good way to look up that information. And then just another plug for the lab. If, you get, if you're working on this stuff and you get stuck, come see us. We're glad to help. Okay. All right, so um, we're going to build just a custom function here, and then we'll go use it in a bunch of different access locations so that you can see where we can, how that all works. All right. Okay, so first of all, the structure of a function, you want to declare whether it's public or private. Now, private means that the function is only available within the module where it is placed. So if your function is used by other functions on that same module, then that's the right scope. Otherwise, you do want to make it public so that you can use it other places. 
see what I type correctly. Um, all right, so let's do a commission. This is kind of a, just an easy math. Um, pretend like we uh, have uh, some salespeople here, and we have I have a table, actually. Let me show you that real quick. So I have a table here of some sales. I just have a date in here and then a sales total. Your real data would look um, much more interesting, but this is just for example. All right, so what, what we want to say is um, we have several different sales commission levels. So if you sell a million dollars or more, you get 10% commission. If you sell less than that, you only get 5% commission. All right, now, um, this is a, you know, if you're creating a commission function like this, it would likely be used in lots of different places. So you don't want to just write it into a query, and then that's the only place where it lives. So we'll go to Visual Basic and create this function of commission. All right, so we're going to have to know what the sales total is. So I'm going to So this is an input. So when you create a function, you get to give it a name. This one right here where it says commission, this is a name I made up. This is not built in anywhere. You can make this up. You can make this be whatever you want, as long as there's no spaces. All right, anything inside the parentheses, that's data that's getting passed into the function. If I want more than one thing, like say where we were doing something about the, the time frame, um, I could put another parameter in there. Right. If I want this to be optional, I can just use the word optional. Then that means I don't have to fill it in unless that's the information that I want to pass in there. Um, for this example, we'll just get rid of that. Okay, the next thing you need is you gotta tell the computer what the output value is gonna be. Um, and to do that, you just have to give it a data type. Um, so we're also going to pass back a double data type. All right. And then inside this function, you can, you can write whatever code you need to to go get your data from the database or pull it off of a screen, somebody entered in some data, you know, whatever's ha happening here, you can write that code into this function. Or if you need to do some other math on it. But we'll just do a... Um, do a select case on that sales total. Oops. Not in case, sorry. All right, so let's start off. If the oops. So if, if the sales total is greater than or equal to one million, then commission. So we say what, 10% commission? So we're taking whatever the sales total is, if it's greater than a million dollars, multiplying it by 10%. And then this statement right here where we say commission equals, that's assigning the value back to the definition of the, com of the function, which then will return back to where you originally used it. And then if we have case is less than, oh, we'll just do case else here. All right, so otherwise, you get 5% commission. All right, now, if we just want to test this to make sure that this works, I can't click in here and click run on this function because functions you can't just, access doesn't let you just run the function. Because it's returning a value, it needs to know, well, where are we going to put that data? So we got to create a sub and the sub we can run and then inside there we'll go call the function. So we'll just test it like this with a message box and we will talk, this, the message box is actually a built-in function. 
we'll talk about that more later. Um, commission, and then we'll just put in million and a half. All right, so now when I run this, oh, is that right? Did I not? Yeah. Oh, how about format this? Actually, we could probably do, ah, let's do this. There we go. Yeah, so 10% of a million five is $150,000. We wanted to do the same thing, and we'll take out a couple of zeros. Oh, now the commission's only 750 bucks. Because that's 5% of less than. George? Can, can you call the function directly in the immediate window? Okay, yes. So the question is, um, thank you. The question is, can you call the com or can you call the function in the immediate window? Um, now, the immediate window is a place where you can go and test out your code as it's running. Um, you can also test it out other places. So I just do a question mark if I want to know what's happening. So I go commission and put in whatever the dollar is. So the answer is yes. Now, so, um, so you can use this function now anywhere inside Visual Basic, but you can also go use this in Access. So let's flip over to here. All right, so we have this table that just has a few sales figures in it. And what I'm going to do is create a query. All right. So here, just in our query, we just have the sales total. I threw the ID in there just for grins. Okay, now I want to go use that function that I just built. Oh, you know, I'm, it may ask me to save this first. Hang on. Um, yes, we have a brand new module and leave it called module one there. Um, now that it's saved, now it should work. So I'm typing, I know, I apologize, this is a little small. I'll zoom it in in a second here. Um, all right, so what I did is I just created Just created a new column, and I used the function, so we can zoom in here. So I used that same function, and I'm passing into it now, instead of you know just typing in a regular number like we've been looking at, I'm actually going to pass in the value of the field from this table, the sales total field. And so it has the square brackets. That's the indication that it's a field. Um, all right. And Oh, hang on. I found this little magnifier thing. It's really cool, but it's kind of hard to get out of. There we go. Okay. So now when we run this query, you can see that, um, let's make our font size a little bigger. Okay. So you can see that it calculates correctly. You know, anything under a million is 5%. Anything over a million is 10%. What does that query look like as SQL? The question is, what does this look like as SQL? And unfortunately, I can't make this bigger unless I do a little zoom here. That. So select sales ID, sales total, and then just right here in the SQL, it has the name of the function, and again, passed in the 
field name of sales total, and I'm giving it an alias as commission amount, so that's giving it a new, a new field name um, from sales. Yes? <laughs> no, that's okay. Can you use the function in a calculated field in a table? I do not know the answer to that. We'll go try it, huh? You mean like? Go to your table definition and field that is calculated. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so we'll go here. So you want this to be a. Um, Commission amount, and we want this to be a calculated field. Okay. Ah, okay. So what it, it does here now is it asks us for this expression builder. So maybe this is a good time to look at this. Um, can everybody see this expression builder screen okay? All right. Okay. Over in this first column, um, the whole purpose for this little window is to help you write functions and pass in the or fill in the correct parameters so that um, when you're using these functions in Access, you get it right. I mean, it's a little helper tool. Now, if you know how the syntax goes, you can certainly type it. You do not have to use this tool. But this is a kind of a, a way to, to use what you've... Uh, um, Built-in functions. Cancel this. So calculated field. I've actually never used calculated field in Access. I'm sorry. Look, comments from the audience here. <laughs> okay, so. Um, George, it looks like the question is maybe not. Or the answer is maybe not. Can you use this as a calculated field? Now you can use um you can use all these built in functions, which we're gonna go through a bunch of these. What happens when you click on sales That's the table. Yeah, that's just the table that we're in. Constants operators now. Um, see, when you're in a query, let me go back to this query one here. Oh, sorry. Well, let me just type this. Um, I'm guessing it's not going to like this. Yeah. So I guess the answer to that question is no, you cannot use custom functions in a calculated field in the table. All right. All right, so let's go back to the query here. Design view. Okay. Now, if I wanted to use, if I didn't know which arguments were involved in this commission function, I could use the expression builder to help me um, write this code here. So now we're in the expression builder. Now we get a few more choices. Um, okay, this first column is, this is like a three pane, you're kind of digging down into things. So in this first column, it gives you kind of the high level categories of where you might find your functions. Um, here, if you have anything in query one, like you can use the other fields that are already in this query that I'm working on. Um, if we go to built-in functions, they are here by the categories, and then this third column gives you the details of each one. So if you wanted some date-time functions, um, you click in the middle column, and then over on the right-hand side, um, let's see what should we use? Oh, date's an easy one. Okay, date's plain old function. It has no arguments to it. The date function return looks at your computer's clock, and it returns today's date, or whatever the computer thinks it is. Um, if you are using like a DLOOKUP function, it actually has a few arguments. 
So there's an expression, which is to be evaluated, um, the domain, which is where you're going to get the data, and then the criteria, what, what specific thing are you looking for? Um, and we'll, well, again, we'll come back to that one. Um, now, if I, so that's on the, all on the built-in functions. You can search through here and find what you need. This one now, this next group down, dog functions, that happens to be the name of my access database file. So that's why it shows here there uh, as um, dog functions. And you can see that all my modules are listed now as categories. So I had, the first one says intrinsic functions. It's a little testing. There's no, there's no actual function on that page or on that module. Module one, there's the commission function we just wrote. Um, file handling, you see there's a few functions there. And then some custom functions module, there's a few more. Right? And these are all that are custom things that I've already added into this access database. So if we want to use our commission function, we go to the module. And then we click commission. Now it says here, oh look, D sales total. D is my little abbreviation for double. So um, I know that I have to put some kind of number in there. So if I click in there, it automatically highlights the whole name of that argument. And the idea is it highlights it for you because that's just a placeholder. The little, um, I don't know if you can see, try to magnify this again. You see there's the little double brackets there at the beginning and the end. That is just a placeholder for that argument. Um, so if you leave that in your function, your function might get a little confused. So what we want then instead is I'm going to go grab from my query one, double click sales total. It'll type that field name in there for me, put the brackets in there so that I know it's a field. And I see there's no extra weird little um, greater than, less than signs or any other extraneous text. And so I'm just going to say OK. And you can see here, it wrote the function for me, just exactly like I did manually over here in this other column. It gives it the generic title, expression one, and of course you can change that name. Um, and you can see that the two columns do exactly the same thing. All right. Leave that. OK. You can also use functions in a form. Like say that, um, oh, let me change this. Let's do this. So say we want a blank form. We have a blank form here. We'll put a. Um, Call this one sales total, and we'll call this one commission. All right. Naming my text boxes. Text one and text two are never good ideas. All right, now I can also format these. I'm just going to do that real quick to make it a little easier to look at when we got some currency. Okay, so just plain old form, nothing fancy here. I'm going to type in, um, you know, whatever the sales total would be. And we want in this text box for it to use that same function and calculate our commission. So we'll come over here. Now I can type it in right here. Right? Like if I know the arguments and I know how it goes, I can just type it right in. But here's a cool thing. They added this, um, I'm not sure which version of Access, but it's been a, a relatively recent one. If you're over here in the Properties screen, this little property sheet, turn it off, turn it off, double click also gets you there. Um, but if you go over here to Control Source and you type in Equals and you start typing, ah, Access gives you the little suggestions of, hey, you started with C-O-M-M. -M. Do you want a command before execute M macro? Uh, no, I think, oh, here's one, commission. That's the one we want. So I do that one. And then I can start typing. Um, I can start typing T-X-T. And it says, oh, wait a minute. 
Do you want to fill it in with something that's on your form? So TXT sales total, absolutely that's what I want to use. All right. Oh, it, you always have to put in the end bracket. It kind of throws a fit over that. Okay, so now the same thing that we've seen before, except now instead of filling in the field name, we're just grabbing it from the text box. Okay. Oh, and there we go. So our commission or our sales are 15000 Commission is 750 bucks. We add some more zeros in there, 15 million. Now commission is 1,500,000, 10%. All right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> huh. All right, so now the, the nice thing about doing, you know, creating your function in code is that if this does change, you don't have to go rewrite all of your screens, you don't have to go rewrite your reports, you don't have to go change your queries. All you have to do is here, go change your function. So if we wanted, um, what? Yeah, oh, okay, above million to be 20%. All right, we can do that. And then let's see here. What if we do? Sorry, it's less than less than ten thousand dollars. Ah, whoops. Helps if I type. Okay, it's less than ten thousand dollars. Sorry, you don't get a commission. Greater than a million, you get 20%. Um, anything else, you'll just still get five. Sound good? All right. So now all we do is we just... Um, but, okay, now we have no commission. Oh. One more zero. Okay, yeah, so now at $2 million, we get... Um, just so I can click at the tech box. There we go. But $2 million of sales, now we get $400,000 worth of the commission. All right, make sense? Okay, if you were in, um, so we're here in a form and you use the control source property to fill in a field on a text box. Um, you can also use a function as a default value. So say that, um, Say that you maybe have an orders system and your default ship date is always five days after the order date. So you could say, you know, in our default value here, go grab our function to figure out what the ship date is if you have a custom function. Um, sure, so I have another form here. Okay, and this one's doing kind of the same thing. So this text box, in the control source, um, actually you can see it right there, it's easier to in the properties. Right. I want this text box to show up on my form and I want it to grab today's date, which is also one of the built-in functions. And then I'm going to use the format function to figure out what kind of date format I want on that. So when I look at it, it tells me today is Tuesday, January 5, 2016. Once we open this tomorrow, it'll say tomorrow's date. Um, okay, all right. Okay, so let's look at a couple of others. So that, you know, sales commission thing is pretty basic. I have a few other things that I've put in here already that we can just kind of look through and see how they work. Um, All right, so um, let me. Okay, so here's the next business day function. Um, when I, I work, I used to work at Schwab, and we did a lot with. I mean, there was always holidays, and you know, you have to because it's a financial industry. You have to reconcile all your stuff every single day. 
But there were some days when the banks weren't open, and there were some days when the stock market wasn't open. So we had this master list of dates that were holidays. Um, so we'd always have to know, because any time we get the data in, it would always be for the previous business day. So that would be actually going backwards here. We're looking forwards a little bit. But um, but we had so we all had these functions that were written that says, is this a business day or what is the previous business day? Um, and then we also had to factor in the holidays. So in this case, we're, we're assuming that there are no holidays, but um, we're taking a, passing in a date. There's a date to consider. And then we're going to figure out which day of the week it is. And if it's a Friday or Saturday, we know we have to skip over till Monday. Um, otherwise, the next business day is always going to be tomorrow. Right, so I just did a little select case statement here. And um, we're using the weekday function, which will return a um, um, so this. What I did to get the little yellow hint is control I. If you're ever in a built-in function and you need some help to figure out what you're, what you're looking at here, control I will get you that little help. Um, all right, so this, this weekday function takes two arguments. One is um, what is the actual date that we're looking at? And then, um, oops, sorry. The second argument is optional. You can see that it's in square brackets. That's the kind of the VBA code for this is an optional argument. You don't have to put it in. Um, and then it says equals VB Sunday. So if you don't put it in, they assume you mean that Sunday is the first day of the week. Um, you can actually choose any day of the week to be your first day of the week. If you want to confuse um, anybody who's reading your code, <laughs> make the first day of the week Wednesday and then <laughs> So Wednesday would be day number one, Thursday would be day number two. Um, but as it is, Sunday's day number one, Monday's day number two. So, um, so if it's Friday, we want to make sure that the next business day is going to be two days later, or three days later, I'm sorry, because we're going from Saturday, Sunday to Monday. And if it's Saturday, we want it to be skip Sunday and then go to Monday. And if it's any other day of the week, then the next business day is accurate just by adding one. Right. So here we can get a, um, now if I want to I can click this little three dot button at the end of the control source line and that's going to open up the expression builder again. So if I want to go find my functions, dog functions, Here's some custom ones. There's the next business day. I double click and it, all it's asking for is a date. So in this case, I'm just going to plug in today. All right, so next business day from today is tomorrow. Oh, I'm in data, or I'm in the layout view. It's letting me change properties there. Okay. So again, there's lots of ways you can get that, those functions in there. You start typing and it gives you some help, or you go into that expression builder and then you can navigate through that and find what you need. Um, and same thing with any of this. Um, so I, I tried to play with uh, using some of these things on labels or other objects, and it really needs to be, because it's a calculation, um, it needs to be a text box or a combo box or something that can handle your data. So labels, you can't put functions in your labels, um, unless you use code to do that. All right. Um. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at some built-in functions. All right, so let me show you these couple of websites that I found. Um, okay, this is the tech on the net. Oh, I have to hang on. 
your access window. Yeah, I know. Um, I was opening these two pages before I threw it up here. Okay. Okay, so this is the Microsoft um, list of functions. This is the link that I had in the in the PowerPoint. Um, and it just groups them all by different types of functions. There's a bunch of them here. Scroll, scroll, scroll. At the very end of this list, it lists them alphabetically. And at any on any of these, if you want to find out what it is, just click on it. It gives you a um, description of it and examples. It's Microsoft, so sometimes examples are good and sometimes they're not. And sometimes they're helpful and sometimes they're not. Um, so here's another option too if you need uh, another choice. This uh, um, techonthenet.com, all kinds of interesting stuff here. So they have, um, and this also lists them by category. So we'll go through a bunch of these here. Okay, um, so I have a couple of variables that I've declared here at the beginning, and this is just a subroutine. This itself is not a function because I want to be able to run this and test out all of these other functions that we're talking about. All right, so starting out with some math functions. Um, <clears throat> this, this round function is something that I use a lot. Uh, actually, before I go into this, um, when you're using functions in VBA, there's a little bit different list than the ones that are available in the expression builder to use in queries and reports and other access objects. They're pretty much the same, like the round function is in both. The integer function, you know, these that we're talking about here, most of them are in both places, but there are a few that, that don't cross over. So um, just be aware of that. All right, so first of all, this debug.print, what that's going to do is just type something in this immediate window down here for me. Um, I could have used a message box with all this. That's another common way of testing things is you just throw it in a message box. But um, I, got, I didn't want to have to click a message box every time we're doing this. So debug.print just prints it to the immediate window. Um, All right, so if I'm going to assign my, I'm going to have, I have a double value here, and I'm going to put it negative 500.849. If I want to round that, actually, let's make this a positive number first. Okay, if I want to use the round function, it takes two arguments. The first argument is, what is the number? And the second argument, how many places after the decimal do you want? All right, if I want zero places, this, is, this should round up to 501. So if I just run that, yep, 501 is what we got. If I want to round it to one decimal place, now we got 500.8. If I want it to two decimal places, now we're at uh, 500.85. Now, if you just want, if you just want the whole number part of a number, you don't want to round it up or down. You just want that whole number to skip any decimal place. That way, that's the int function. Oh, in the wrong place, there we go. And what that does is that just chops off the integer value. Um, sure, negative, it does the same thing. Oh, but wait a minute. <laughs> it doesn't do the same thing. See how that rounded it? Because when you're dealing with negative numbers, now you're on the other side of zero. So now it's finding the closest whole number to your negative number, which means it goes down one farther. So if you were in a position where you really need to get whatever that part is before the decimal place, regardless of plus or minus, we can use the fixed function. Because what that does that actually does grab just that number, whatever it is. Positive, negative, doesn't matter. It's always grabbing that, um, just the part before the decimal.
All right. Um, if you need to find, sometimes you don't care whether it's plus or minus. Like there was a, um, I, I built a query in a database recently to compare um, what what had been entered into the database compared to what had been entered onto a paper form that was then put in by data entry. Um, and so I wanted to know if we were off. And it doesn't. It, it didn't matter which direction we were off, whether it was plus or minus. I wanted to find the number places where we were off the biggest amount. So I used the absolute value, and in this case, then it just strips off the plus or minus, and you always get the positive number. Yes. Question. Do you Um, no, that's a good question. So does the, do the int and fix change the data type? Yes, they do, because they return an integer. Um, if you are interested in um, any of these definitions, all you have to do is just click your mouse in the function, press F1, and wait for the internet. Oh, you have landed on our redirector pages. Okay. Sometimes it takes you right to the page. Sometimes you got to do another click. All right. But any any of the built-in functions, you press F1, you get Microsoft's help and definition of that function. Um, so it returns the integer portion of a uh, number. The required number argument is a double or any valid numeric expression. Okay, both int and fix remove the fractional part of the number and return the resulting integer value. What? So you, yes? What? Go ahead. I um, posted a question about banker rounding. Okay. Oh, yes. That. I don't know if we want to go into the whole discussion about that, but if people would be able to read it in their comments or in the questionnaire, the chat area. Oh, okay, yes. So the question is, uh, for those of you online, um, there's a question about bankers rounding. And I know that that is different than regular rounding, but I'm not sure what the rules are. I don't have the chat window. Yeah. Yeah, because I posted it to your. Um, I think yeah, it's so. good enough just to note that there is access uses bankers rounding and you should read the help file to really understand. Oh, access does use bankers rounding? Okay. Okay, so VBA uses bankers rounding. All right. There, there is a huge knowledge base article that lists about 20 different ways to round. And the important <laughs> thing is people use Excel. Excel in a cell on a worksheet uses arithmetic rounding, but DBA in both Excel and Access use banking rounding. Difference. Right, yes, there are differences between Excel and Access. And yeah, so Excel uses, um, when you're looking at it on the spreadsheet, it, it, you said um, it uses regular or, or, or arithmetic rounding. And then bankers rounding is what it uses in VBA. And Access uses that too. And what is the difference? Do you know? That's why there's a bunch of Oh, that's why we go online and read the big long article. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so bankers so, rounding is. In a nutshell, bankers rounding, even numbers are basically truncated where odd numbers are rounded. So 3.5 becomes 4, but 4.5 becomes 4 in bankers rounding. Oh. Yeah, okay. That's why you got to go read your Gotcha. For those of you online, there was a little in room discussion here about what is bankers rounding and sounds kind of complicated, like there's lots of rules about it, so. Oh. Yeah. So <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask, which your internet page was vague on, 
And to be honest, I should know the answer, but I don't. And that's on Inton uh, fits. It says integer portion, but it never says whether it returns an integer or long. Okay, so the question was, does, so the original question that was asked was, what actually gets returned by int and fix? Is it an integer or what data type is it? Um, we know it takes a double or any numeric expression, but it looks like it returns a long, because an integer only goes to 32,000. And so here we're at a whole bunch. How many zeros did I put in? That's 50 million. Let me erase this and see what we get. Yeah, so the, the answer to that is that it does actually return a long, if that's what is called. Um, I don't know what data type it comes back, but it handles all kinds of numbers. I don't know if there's a limit. Oh, now we got a pound sign back here. What's that about? Oh. Huh. Okay. Hmm. Okay. All right. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so the absolute value. And then this is an interesting function. I can't imagine when you might want to use it just the val function, it returns numbers in a string, but only if the string starts with numbers, and as soon as it hits a non-numeric character, it stops returning numbers. <laughs> so in this case, it's going to give us nothing, zero, because there's nothing, because it starts with a z. Um, but if I take out the Z and run it again, now it gives me the first part of the number, but it doesn't find this last number four in there. So, yes? Oh, taking house numbers out of addresses. That might be a good use for that. And it's still in there, but you see into Gotcha. Thank you, Sco. Val is in there for backward compa backward compatibility. Um, so, all right. Um, obviously, also with math functions, you can. Um, you can use cosine and tangent and do a bunch of statistics and some other stuff like that. Um, all right, so now let's go to the string functions. These are fun. All right, so I'm just going to assign my test string to uh, some data goes here. And just run this. Okay, so the, the len function tells you how long that string is, how many characters are in it, 14 in this case. Um, the left function will grab the leftmost characters of any string, however many you tell them to. In this case, I told it to just grab three, so we get those three characters. Same thing with the right function. Um, the mid function is a little different. It has three arguments instead of just um, two. The first argument is what string are you looking at? Where are you starting is the second string, and then how many characters do you want is the third argument, the length. So um, back before there was the replace function, you could actually look at every character in a string, and you know if you needed to get rid of spaces or get rid of apostrophes, you could run through each one. Um, or if you need to just pull out the middle of something and you know that it always starts at character 5, um, you can do that. 
The in strings function is super helpful because if you want to find something that is in your um, in your text, it'll return the number, um, the character number where that letter is first found. So in this some data here, if I start um, from character one, I'm looking in the test string, I'm looking for the letter E, it should give me a four, because that's the fourth character in the string. I do that, yep, sure enough, gives me a four. Did you have a question, Patrick? Well, can I back you up to the function? Yes. Copy, copy that one. Mm -hmm. And then return the last parameter. Mm. Right, because that last argument was optional. Right, so I'm coming. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And so, ah, uh, the, the mid. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Yes, if you miss that last argument on the mid function, you get everything from that point to the end. That's actually very powerful. A lot of people don't realize they think, oh, I can do that with right. But to use the right function, you have to calculate how many characters mm. after that point you pick. For the mid, you just have to specify the point and it's dynamic. Right. So if you, yeah, you could you could use the right function to do the same thing, but yes, you have to then, how many characters do we want? Oh, well, we want the length of characters. Let's see. Ah, we do. So you'd you'd have to take the whole length of the string and minus the however many characters you know if you were looking for a particular character, um, and that happens a lot in code too. But that is good to know that the mid does that just by leaving the last argument off. All right, um, so the in string then will find you a character. The in string REV for reverse starts at the back end of your string and searches towards the front. So in this case, um, going forward it gets character number four, going backward it gets character number 14. Now, in string reverse, there's a really handy thing you can do with this. Um, I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, but I'm sorry. Right. Um, when you're looking for, if you have file names and you want to pull, um, so here's a few functions that I actually copied from someone else on the internet. I did not write them, I modified them a little bit, but I definitely stole them. Um, if you want, okay, here we go. If you want to get the file name from a full path of something, um, you can take, here's an example of this. Right. Okay, so here we're using the right function, but we're looking at the whole string, and then we're grabbing the length of it minus, so here we're looking from the back to find the last backslash, which is going to give me then the end of the end of the path, which then becomes the file name, right? So, okay. In this case, I have a long. Um, oh, it's to this database that we're looking at. That's the path of it on my computer here. And let me do. Okay, folder from the path. What that does, that grabs. So here, if we want to look at that. Okay, so we're grabbing the left of the path minus, or I mean the left of the path only up until when we're looking from the end of the string to find the last the last backslash. So here in string reverse, go from the end, find me the last backslash, and then we want only the left portion of that, which gives me this path minus my file name. All right, if we do the next thing here, and now we're just going to grab the file name, so we're kind of doing the back, the reverse of that. Now that gives me just the 
file name that we're looking at. And this one here, so again, length minus, go from the end and grab that last backslash, and then grab the right-hand side of that, which then gives me the file name. And we can do the same thing. These two other functions just grab the uh, um, getting the file name without the extension and then grabbing the extension minus the file name. All right. Um, there's a space function. Um, this is interesting. If you have fixed length data, um, when I was working at Schwab, we had a lot of text files that, you know, the first 10 characters were the name. If the name only took up four space, you know, four characters, the other six had to be six spaces. Um, and, you know, and, and some databases have um, fixed length fields rather than variable length fields. So if you're putting data into those kind of fields, you have to make sure you pad it with enough spaces to get what you need. So in this case, if I have a 50 character field that requires all those extra spaces, this function of space 50, it just creates 50 spaces. All right, so you have a string of 50 spaces. I concatenate that onto the end of my data. And then from that, I take the left 50 characters because that's all is going to go in that field anyway. All right, does that make sense? Um, we can see it, but um, I can run this, but it's kind of, I do this. You can see how, see how it actually put those 50 spaces back on there. And then when I asked for the length of it, it tells me it's 50. All right. <clears throat> um, some other fun functions, whoops, some other useful functions. Oh, come on. All right, uppercase and lowercase. These are kind of cool. I, uh, um, so uppercase and lowercase, that just forces everything uppercase or everything lowercase. Um, I had a client who, um, he turned on the caps lock because he doesn't like typing capital letters. No, we don't want all of our data to look like it's being shouted at or shouted. You know, we don't want it all in capitals. My engineering dad, does, my engineer dad, does that too. <laughs> Types in all capitals. Um, but we can do, we can convert this string into a sentence case, which then capitalizes the initial letters of each word, which is this function right here, string c o n v. Um, and you have lots of choices for this, actually. So we, we give it a we give it the string that we're changing, and then um, proper case means capitalizing every letter. Um, no wait, there's my short list. Okay, you can actually change it into Unicode, katakana, hiragana. Those are the Japanese um, alphabets. Um, some of these other ones I don't know. Narrow and wide. I'm not really sure what those are. Um, but proper case is definitely a useful thing. And I have a little example of how this works. Um, so here on this customer name field, I'm, all, I'm typing in all lowercase and it's capitalizing it for me. And this is something that's kind of fun. Um, I just use the key press event. And what this does, All right. Um, so what this does is this will change the characters as you are typing them when you use key press. Um, this event takes one argument, is the ASCII code of the character you pressed. So if I press the letter F on the keyboard, um, ASC is the function to convert from character to ASCII and CHR converts it back the other way. So if I wanted to see what the ASCII code was for the letter F, sorry, I just use the ASCII function, and it tells me, oh, 
That's a 102. So if I want an uppercase, wait a minute, hang on. If I want the ASCII code of the uppercase letter F, that is 70. All right, so what I'm doing in here is um, when as soon as you type a character into that text box, it gets fed into this procedure, and then I have a little select case that says, oh, if that character that you just typed happens to be a single quote, which is uh, 39, or a double quote, which is character 34, um, then I want to return a zero, which means it's not going to actually let me use that letter, that character. Um, if I put, and I just put this in for example, if I put in a space, I want it to put an underscore and give me back an underscore instead. No spaces are allowed in this field. Otherwise, what I want to do is I want to uppercase, or uppercase every letter that I typed in. So what I have to do is take this ASCII code that comes in, convert it to a character, then uppercase it, then convert it back to ASCII, and then send it back out, and then it ends up back in the text box. All right, so let's go look at it again. And so as I'm, now I just typed a backspace. It's fine with that. I type numbers. It's okay with that. Space. Oh, and now I'm typing lowercase letters, and it capitalizes them for me. And I typed a single quote. It won't go in. Double quote won't go in. <laughs> and this is strictly for keystrokes. I tried to catch. I tried to catch the Control V for paste, <laughs> and you can't. Like it, it does catch your backspace. It catches your tab. It catches. Like it catches all the keys on the keyboard. But when you do the combinations of Control with V, in, in this case for paste. Um, right, because whatever, yeah, see, I just pasted whatever was on the clipboard. <laughs> it put it in, it did not follow my values. Um, I tried to come up with a way to restrict that, and I don't know, if anybody has any suggestions on how to prevent pasting in a text box, then, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so the problem we're discussing in the room here is that if you if you just paste in whatever you you know, copy it from somewhere else and paste it in, you're not you're not getting those you're not having to follow those rules that I just defined on that key press event. Um, and so there are better ways to handle that in a user interface to make sure that your data is good. Yes, go. Gotcha. So apparently control V for paste is is trappable, but uh, a little more involved than what we have time for here. All right, good. But I just thought that was interesting, the ASCII and the character function. Um, I used this forever ago, and I can't remember if it was because it was part of some class that I was teaching for New Horizons back in the day, or if there was an actual real-world example of this. But if you do need to refer to a double quote, like if you're looking in your, your data, um, finding those single quotes and double quotes is hard because you can't tell the computer to go, quote, 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 find me that double quote. <laughs> It doesn't work. So what you have to actually do is if you're using, if you want to search for a double quote like an in string or something, you have to actually do chr34, that'll get you your double quote. And it'll find it that way. All right. Oh, okay. So then, um, so string inverse. This one right here, <laughs> I had to laugh when I found this one. String reverse. <laughs> <laughs> Comment from the peanut gallery here. <laughs> so if I did a string reverse, it literally reverses all the characters in my string. Not sure why you'd ever want to do that, but it's there if you need it. <laughs> oh, yes, it might help you practice the, back practice the backwards talking. Right on. <laughs> Oh, 
somehow replay somehow repeating jokes on a recorded session seems kind of anticlimactic. All right. So going backwards up to your uh, screen convert function for a second. Uh -huh. uh, just the sidebar on the example proper case that does not work with proper name. You're going to have to resort to a custom VBA function to handle this thing. Yeah, if you have like. Uh -huh. Yes, that is one limitation of the uh, proper case um, conversion is O'Brien's and the McDonald's and those kind of names. Yeah. Yes, and if you have acronyms where all, thing, all the letters are capitalized, um, that does not work that way as well. But for my client who insisted on using the caps lock key, this was a good solution for him. <laughs> all right. Um, moving on, okay, so we have some trim functions, the right trim and left trim. They just take the spaces off of the front or the back of our string. Like here, this string has a bunch of spaces before and after. Um, uh, okay, so right trim. You can see took off the space after or the spaces afterwards, but not before. Left trim took off the spaces before, but not after. And regular trim took off spaces before and after. Now, depending on which kind of database you're working with, you may get all like there's all of these functions are available in um, the SQL language as well. So if you're working with a field and you want to trim right and left. You got to really depend on, or you got to pay attention to which kind of database you're working with. In SQL Server, you only have left trim and right trim. There's no trim. In Access, you can use all three. All right, and then the replace function. Um, when I again, when I was working at Schwab, we had lots and lots and lots of code written in Excel in VBA that manipulated all these text files and all all this data. And they actually had functions that did this replace action. So you can actually write out, take your string, look at the first character, is it what you want? Rip, you know, look at the second character, you loop through the whole thing, build a new string, pass that back. Um, or you can just use the replace function. Much, much, much easier. Um, so if I just replace this, the um, spaces with an underscore, there we go. Um, the replace function is really helpful if you need to clean up your data before, as you're checking it after the users have entered it. Make sure you got no um, illegal characters according to your database. If there's, you know, maybe some apostrophes, you can replace them with a double apostrophe that'll make you, make the data go into the database. Um, but very handy function. Okay, so now we have some. They're um, in, they're categorized as inspection functions, but they're really just a, is this data, this, what is this data? Is it, is it here? Is it not here? Is it null? Is it empty? Is it a number? Is it a date? Um, okay, so we're going to get a, I have a variance now. Let's see, let's use that one. One. Sorry, the little uh, that one. Okay, so I have a variant here, and I have assigned it no. Oh, we got a. I tried to convert it and is numeric and it's um. That's what it freaked out on. Okay, so is it null true? Is it a date? False. Is it numeric? I can get rid of that. Let's do a plan with something. Okay, there we go. All right. So if I if I assign a null value to my variant, um, is null returns true? Is date returns false? Is numeric returns false? Is empty also returns false? Now. There's is empty and is missing, and I've always been really confused about those until I looked them up today. So here's how they work. They're only good to use. They're only good to use with variants. 
if you have a specific kind of data, like if you have a string, if you don't put anything in the string, it's a zero length string. If you don't put anything in the number value, you get zero. If you don't put anything in the date, I believe you still get zero. Um, if you don't put anything in a variant, then you can test to see if it's empty. Um, like see here, because because I assigned it null, it's not empty. It has a null value in it. That is something real. But if I assign it as empty, now oh wait, let me make sure we get this right. And okay, now. Okay, no, no, it's not no. It's certainly not a date. It's um oh it's a new it's a number? <laughs> well that's interesting. Um but it is true. <laughs> it is true that it is empty. <laughs> and is missing you can use within a function to see if somebody has filled in or if the if an optional parameter has been filled in. Um <laughs> All right, so is numeric will find numbers, is dates, find it finds dates. Um, it is smart enough to know if I put in 220, this year is a leap year in 2016, last year was not. So if I do, if I make our variant hold 2 slash 29 slash 2015, um, Nope, it's not null. It's not a date. Even though it looks like a date, it's not a real date because that's not an actual day. If I change that and make it 28 and do it again, now it gets that it's a date. Um, and even though I passed it in as a string, it still looks at it and says, oh, could this be a date? Um, along with the is null, there's another, okay, so. Okay, so the nz function, nz is for null to zero, but um, this is a specifically access thing. If you use VBA and other Office products, it's not available in Excel, it's not available anywhere else. Um, it's just access specific thing. And what it does is it looks at any value that you pass into it, and it says, if it is null, your second argument says what you get to put in its place. Um, so this is handy if you're, if you're doing some math and you need to make sure that any null values get evaluated as zero. Or maybe, I mean, it, it really depends on your particular um, situation. But in this case, let's, let's see, what should we make our, do this. Okay, so we'll assign our variance value of null. Now I'm just going to run these. And the first thing gives us a quote, quote, there's nothing there. You see, it's just nothing. Um, instead, and this next one says, okay, if it's null, I want it to tell me missing data. So sure enough, there it does. This third case here, it puts in um, a zero. And on this last case, if it's null, huh, give me today's date. Now, the, null, the NZ function you can use within a SQL statement in Access. You can use it in a query, you can use it in a form, you can use it in VB, you can use it everywhere. It's really a very helpful function. Just don't try to use it in Excel because it doesn't work. Okay. All right, so um, we've got 10 minutes left, so let's just skip past a few of these. Well, I guess we're almost done. Okay, so there's... Um, the other conversion functions, um, Visual Basic and Microsoft products in general are pretty good about implicitly converting your data. So if it can figure, if the computer can figure out, oh, this looks like a number, it must be a number. It can convert it to the number. Um, not all databases are really good at that. So depending on what kind of data source you're working with, you may have to explicitly convert your data. And sometimes you also run into situations where things just don't work. And so making it an explicit conversion is sometimes a solution for that. Because um, then you're taking the guesswork out of it. Um, and all of the conversion functions start with the letter C. And then the data, abbreviation of a data type that they're converting to. 
like in this case here, C-I-N-T convert to an integer. Um, C-L-N-G converts to a long, a long integer. Um, C-D-A-T converts to a date. C-S-T-R converts to a string. Um, I think we can try a couple of these just to see. So here, um, if I give my variant something that's clearly not a number, it's going to freak out. Because here I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to, well, we'll see. Oh, yep, we got type mismatch. Uh, we have a problem. Okay, so in this first case, it did actually do this line correctly. It took my plus sign, changed it to, and kind of interpreted it as an ampersand, like I'm concatenating two strings together. So it took x5 and then space 6, put it in there. Um, if I take out the x, and then we run this. So this, uh, let's see, we got three lines. Okay, so these are the three lines that printed. This first line, um, I just put it with the five in there plus the six. It did still think with those spaces in there, it did get confused on that. But once I convert it to a number and then add on a string six, it says, oh, that six looks like a number. I think we'll just add it and give you 11. So these last two both um, ended up 11, whether you trim the spaces off or not. It's pretty good. Um, we talked about the ASCII and the character. Um, all right, so let's skip over and do some date and time functions. These are fun. Okay, so um, everybody knows the difference between date and now. Date gives you just today's date, and now will give you the time as well. And this is one of those things that's different between Excel and Access. In Excel, I think the date or the, the right now function is actually today instead of, or no, today is the date function, and now now is the same both places. I don't know. If you get confused, just ask Google, right? Um, okay, so here, pretty straightforward. We get the date or the date plus time. Um, all right, I'm going to assume that the date is right now at this minute. These are very helpful functions here. T date value and time value. They will pull off just the date portion of the date time or just the time portion. So if I tell it that my test date is right now at this minute and then I do this. Oh, I guess we're still getting some of these. But these last two entries here, you can see the date portion here and then just the time portion. So if you have data that comes in that like maybe is a, is a um, one thing I like to do in, um, I'm going to put it in this table. In my tables is to put a date entered field. And then as the default value, I just use the now function. Oh, did you see it tried to type that for me? Says, oh, here we go. There's a built-in function. All right. Um, again, you can also use the expression builder in here. But if I use the def if I use now as the default value, what it does is the moment that record gets added in, it gets that date and time stamp. Now, if I want to say, well, I just want to find all the records entered today, I could do a query that says, okay, between midnight and midnight, or I could just do date value and say where date value is, whatever I'm looking. <clears throat> oh, let's save that. Go back to where are we here? Okay, time value again, same thing. Pulls off just the time. Um, these functions here will extract a portion of your date. All right, so if we look at this whole list here, we got, um, for right now, it is the year is 2016, month is one, day is five, weekday is three, because we're on Tuesday, and because I didn't tell it which day to start, it's assuming Sunday, so Sunday's one, Monday's two, Tuesday's three, um, and then the hour is 19, again, military time, 53 minutes and 19 seconds. 
there, yes, is there question. A, is there a native lookup function? Uh, is there a fix for the weekday problem? Yes, there is. I was very happy to discover this. I've written many of my own built-in functions that if weekday is one, return, quote, Sunday, right? If weekday is two, return, quote, Monday. But there is now a function that does it. It's called weekday name. And it takes the argument of the weekday number. And, um, and then the, the second argument, this is kind of interesting. Um, if it's abbreviate, it's false. It'll give you the full weekday. If you put abbreviate true, it'll give you just the first three, like M-O-N for Monday, T-U-E for Tuesday. All right, so if I do this, you can see it, it just wrote down Tuesday down here. If I make this true, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, and it, if you do true on the abbreviation, you got for TUE for Tuesday. All right, now, the, the best part about all these date functions, though, um, are what you can do. Date serial, date part, date add, and date difference. These are fun. This little control panel for uh, WebEx keeps getting in my way. Um, okay. So if we do a date serial, and I tell it, um, I'm going to grab the year from today. I'm going to grab the month from today, and I'm going to add one. And then I'm going to tell it day zero. Not day one, not day five. Not, I mean, I could. And it would then put all those together and return me the actual date. Um, but if I do date zero, what it does, eh, it gives me the end of the month. So, okay, the month of today is one, and I added one to make it two. So this is actually feeding in 2016 for the year, two for the month, and then zero for the day. And what that does is that makes the fun or the function returns the previous day, which is the last day of the previous month. Right. And I even tried this out because you know what happens if it's December, right? And um, can you add? Okay, if we grab months out of December, that's going to be 12. I'm going to add one to it. It's going to be 13. Oh wait, hang on, that got confusing. That again. 1231. It's smart enough to know that really there is no month 13, and what you really are looking for is the end of the year. Okay, great. There you go. Um, a date part, date add, and date difference, they all use kind of similar arguments. Um, you can tell it which part of the date you want to work with. And every time I go to use this, I have to look it up because it's not one of these things that stays in my head, so I always F1 it. Go online. And we wait for Microsoft. Okay, there we go. Um, and so then they have a, a little cheat sheet about what what we're what you need to put in to get what which part of the date. The so four Ys gives you the year, not two, not just one. You gotta have four. A Q gives you quarter. Um, M for month. N is for minute. That's how they distinguish between the two. Um, w is for weekday, and WW is actually for the week number. And there's, a, there's several ways that they can figure out how you, or which week it is. It's whether the thir first Thursday of the year or which week has the first of the, January 1st in it. It's um, kind of like the, the banker's rounding. There's, there's a whole big uh, um, discussion about really what is week number one. And we end up with 53 weeks sometimes. Anyway. Um, but all of those functions use those same arguments. Date part just pulls out which part it is. Um, and that's the only way to get the quarter, by the way. So if you want quarter one, two, three, or four, you've got to use date part to pull that out. There is not a quarter function. Um, date add will take two dates, and or take a date and then add. Like in this case, I'm adding three years to our date. You can see that um, it's now 2018 here. Date difference says, um, how many, in this case, days, or I could put years, or I could put all kinds of things. How many of those between the two dates? 
And then I have to show you a couple of fun functions that I built for a client um, that use these date functions. So we had to figure out how old people were, and we wanted to know like if they're going to turn 18 or 65, we're, we're grouping people by whether they're a child, an adult, or a senior. And so for purposes of this um, database, 65 and older is senior, 18 to 65 is adult, and 18 and younger is child. So I had to grab, oh my gosh, how old are these people? So how many years old they are between the birth date and then today, whichever date I'm feeding in. Um, and then I have to say, well, have they had their birthday yet this year? If they have, then oops, we subtract, or then no, then, then the birthday is good. But if they haven't yet, so then we have to subtract one to go back a year. Um, and then, we, then I look in the month, and if they've had the birthday this month yet, are they that age or do we have to back it off one? All right. And then here's just another little function that says, what is your age and then which group do you fall in, senior child or adult? All right. Um, there's, there's. Oh, is that are we out of time? Okay. I wanted to talk about the message box function because it is really cool, but maybe we'll save that for another time. All righty. Um, any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Oh, good question. Now has parentheses and date does not. Why is that? I have no idea. Ah, uh, go knows. <laughs> Why is that? And I was going to, after the uh, recording is over, bring up a sidebar. This is also why you need to be very careful to never use the letters E A T in field names and other places because access is notorious for forgetting exactly what date means in a particular context. So in your table, never have a date. You have a strip date, a first date, a mini date, but never use date. Sure, because of Microsoft's inconsistency with how it handles that. Yeah, so the answer to that question is, um, for those of uh, everybody listening online, is why is there no parentheses behind date? It's one of those inconsistencies in uh, VBA. And even if you put the parentheses on there and move off the line, they go away. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes they don't. You're right, sometimes they don't. Um, yeah. So, anyway, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much.